You know, we often say here, um, and I, I believe it's true, in order for you to be the Democratic um, nominee, you've got to get the black vote. And you especially need the, the black female vote. Now, Joe Biden really has a stronghold there. I think it's at about 51% now. How do you beat that? How do you get that vote? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things that we have to do, and this isn't about getting votes, mm -hmm. this is about the United States of America. Mm -hmm. We are going to have to talk openly and candidly about race. Yeah. And we're going to have to go forward and talk about how we got here in the last 400 years, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about race, I say the first day of my presidency, I would announce a formal commission on race mm -hmm. to retell the story of the last 400 years. Okay. And it's not just a in question... In the schools, we need to hear this. But we want that it's got to be a public, formal commission so that we retell the story, not just about the injustice, because most people don't even know what Jim Crow was. Mm -hmm. But it's beyond that. It also, we also have to tell the story of the contributions of the African-American community over centuries, mm -hmm. not just about building this country, but about being the leading moral voice in this country, not for years or decades, but for centuries. Okay. Because <laughs> policy, policy comes out of narrative. Mm -hmm. And the way that you get unjust policies is by telling untrue stories. Mm -hmm. So when we tell the truth, this has got to be a solution-based commission. Mm -hmm. Because when you tell the true story, then you have a policy that's just. Mm. What about economics? Absolutely. Look, you know... Sonny, that I just came out with a plan for the historically black colleges and universities. Yes, we were talking about that at the break, and I, I am actually very impressed with that because my understanding is that you're spending a lot of time in South Carolina. You, your plan that you've rolled out invests more money in, in HBCUs than any other 2020 candidates, about $125 billion, um, because there is a pay gap. There is a, a gap there, and there's a wealth gap uh, in black communities. Why is that the answer for you? We have to understand... As opposed to, let's say, reparations. The role and the history... Well, I'm not... I'm for reparations. I know you are. But there's a different question. The HBCs, you have to go hear the story of why the HBCUs were started originally, mm -hmm. which was to give a chance to people who were explicitly discriminated against legally for mm -hmm. centuries in the most unjust way possible. Right. Yeah. And the role that they played, <coughs> HBCUs have turned out the majority of African American judges mm -hmm. and engineers mm -hmm. and doctors and teachers. <coughs> they have played a critical role in equalizing at some level, not enough, but at some level and giving young African American kids a chance. Yeah. So it's a critical role and in fact because of the way that money has been allocated in this society, which has structurally been discriminatory. They rely too much and disproportionately on tuition. Yes. So that, and they're in and dire government. straits. The, the, there are over 100 of them. They're in dire f fiscal straits. And the, people, the students coming out of them have student debt that's too high because tuition is too high a percent because they don't have big endowments. And the Trump administration made promises that it has not kept. So my point really? about this is yes. you have to understand, look at the history to understand why they're so important. You have to understand why they don't have endowments, which has been about discrimination and racism. <clears throat> and in order to undo that and actually give the best possible chance to those young people, yeah. we have to make sure that those institutions are strengthened, that in fact we give the best possible chance to those institutions which are critical to their communities but to also to the young people who go to them to actually turn out incredibly well. They're a very successful institution. You can look at the outcomes. Okay. And that's why we're so intent, I'm so intent okay. on strengthening them and making sure that we make a substantive and symbolic statement about what we care about in terms of past discrimination and racism. Well, thank you. I know you've given it a lot of thought. <laughs> Mr. Steyer, we have to switch gears just a little bit. This is an obsession on the show with your tie. You wore a tie. <laughs> Megan's obsession. You wore this tie in back in the summer when you came on the show. You wear it every. It's very festive now. It's, do you only own one tie? Is it your favorite tie? <laughs> I just. I have to know. Well, first of all, I have worn a red plaid tie uh -huh. for 
20 years. Okay. And you can wear it to Christmas dinner at my house. <laughs> <laughs> and people have explained to me for 20 years that I have no taste. And I'm you willing to go along with that. You just kept wearing the same tie? Yeah. I... It's a good luck. Okay, we have to go. Is it one tie or oh, many of the same I have a tie. friend who says uh -huh. bad taste is better than no yeah. taste. I didn't think you thought there was one or many. It was lovely to see you. Very nice to see you. Thank good you, Grace. And may I, just, may I just point out, money can buy taste. <laughs>